Hello friends, welcome back to part 3 of Go Agile. Hope you are all doing well. So last time we reviewed the traditional model and also covered Agile Manifesto which is nothing but the 4 Agile values and 12 Agile principles. If you are watching this, either you are involved in Agile in some fashion or the other or trying to learn and become an Agile resource. In any case, you will constantly be bombarded with thoughts of is this worth it or it's more of hype and is it really true what people say and so on. And you know, we like gossip, right? So you might run into the discussion of Agile myths somewhere or the other. So let's quickly see what are some of those common Agile myths in the marketplace. Myth 1. Agile is a silver bullet. I wish it's true. But no, it's not. You can fail just as commonly as you fail in any traditional method. In fact, you can fail faster in Agile. If you wonder why, we will talk enough about it in the upcoming sessions. So park your thoughts. Bottom line, it's not a silver bullet. Myth 2. Agile means no documentation. Agile doesn't mean there is no documentation. Instead of building a large requirements document, you will break it into tiny stories, tasks and focus is only for the upcoming sprint of two weeks or so. When you get to next sprint, you may have new stories or stories already planned. Point is, you have the flexibility to change quite a bit if required. You are not locked into a large requirement document because you already wrote like in the case of traditional projects. By the way, I'll keep using the word sprint, don't get confused. Later we will be talking a lot about sprints. In a nutshell, a sprint uh, for now, just imagine a sprint is the short cycle of development which is generally two to four weeks. But two weeks is becoming standard in most of the places. Once a project is over and if you look back, there will be lots of documentation that would have progressively been built through features, stories, tasks, etc. 3. Agile means no planning. Again, this is not wrong. Don't get confused that in the previous waterfall model, we spoke about planning being a bottleneck. There is some difference in what we consider planning there versus here. In Agile, planning is broken up and happens in multiple ways and multiple places. You are not planning for the next one year. Rather, planning is all for short term. That's the biggest difference. So in Agile, we do daily stand-ups. In a way, we plan for what you're doing that day. We do iteration planning once every two weeks. Then if you go to more matured Agile environments, you do a planning session every three months. So there is certainly planning in Agile. Number four, implementing Agile is easy and also difficult. So some may say implementing Agile is easy and some may say it's difficult. Fundamentally, if you don't learn to ride a bicycle, it's tough. But once you learn, it's easy. If you learn only to some extent, chances are, chances are you will ride for some time and you can fall anytime. But if you learn fully, then riding is a cakewalk. So you will hear this complaint from people who are in the initial stages and who are struggling to implement or who started implementing but then they are implementing it in the wrong way. Number five, Agile is undisciplined. This complaint came in mainly from some of the companies. When they started Agile, they selectively tried out Agile, like doing the daily meetings, but ignoring some of the tougher tasks, such as regularly releasing software in a cadence, because that needs a lot more discipline. But the myth came out that Agile is undisciplined through that. But Agile is very disciplined method where you test, integrate, do demos, get feedback and so on and at a regular cadence. Number six, Agile is new. Well, no, Agile is certainly not new. Agile methods have been around for a long time. The frameworks that are now known collectively as Agile mainly evolved in the late 80s and 90s, which means Agile is mature and an approach that is inherently familiar to many people. Uh, back in the day, we used to call development in spirals, which are also short, maybe three months at best, produce a tangible software regularly, get feedback, then improve and move on. So Agile has been there for quite some time. The only thing is it's now a lot of different frameworks have come under Agile. Number seven, Agile replaces everything that existed before. No, that's wrong. Even now there are companies which still continue on one waterfall methods. In certain engineering and manufacturing areas, still waterfall model is used. We can go on adding any number of myths, but this is just to get an idea on some of the myths in the industry. Let's now quickly look at how a traditional model differs with Agile from a functional perspective. Now you might have seen this picture already. So the left side shows a typical traditional model project where you do a lot of planning up front, scope the entire project and you know what you're planning to build. You know how long it'll take, what resources you need, how much it costs and so on. Which means predominantly your entire project is dependent on the scope, what you're building that is the features. Now on the way, when you introduce any changes, 
that's a big deal discussions negotiations change orders all that happens and result is there will be significant changes to overall time and costs because when you first wrote the scope let's say you thought it will take one year and one million dollars for your project now with the changes you introduced in between it's now one year and four months and the cost is perhaps 1.4 million dollars just i'm quoting some rough numbers then they say, oh, project failed. They didn't meet the timelines, cost overruns. And even they say sometimes, oh, they didn't understand the scope. They did wrong requirements. And all that also results in the same negative impact of cost and time, right? So that's, that's how the features are shown on the top as fixed, while cost and time below are shown as variables. So what does it tell us? Changing requirements in a traditional model is treated as a sign of failure. Agree? Now, on the other hand, you see the right side picture, uh, how it is on the agile projects. The basic principle is that the scope is never fixed. You're not working with a certain set of features in mind. You are leaving the flexibility of changing scope as you want. At any given point, you are setting the time for a particular piece of your software to be developed as two weeks or three weeks and so on. Shorter time frames. So you know exactly how much time you have in hand, how much it costs for this period. And now you plan. See, I'm using the word planning here also. So you plan exactly what part of the software you want to build in the next two weeks or three weeks or four weeks, whatever. Let's do one thing. Rather than referring to this two weeks, three weeks, four weeks every time, let's just call it sprint. That's easy. Easy, right by the way we also use the word iteration to refer to sprint both are same so don't get confused if I use one word for the other at least for now they both should mean the same to you anyways since you know the time and costs upfront for each sprint that remains same and sprint after sprint you can always change your features but you know your base cost for each sprint is going to be the same and at a high level you think a project may take 20 sprints you know how much cost it's going to take and how long it will take for 20 sprints right but again in agile the difference is we don't really do the complete planning and documenting everything for uh, your, uh, let's say the full project, which could have, which could be like 20 sprints because progressively we are making changes. We have the wheel. We, we kept the flexibility to accommodate any changes. Now, there are a lot of people who debate that this is not strictly true in uh, uh, real world. Well, that confusion is always there. But for now, let's not uh, debate about why and and how and all this, but rather just simply, I think, uh, as, a, as a very base concept, let's just keep this in mind and uh, move on. The signers of the Agile Manifesto recognize that scope change is natural and beneficial. Agile approaches specifically embrace change and use it to make better informed decisions and more useful products. That's the bottom line. Okay, friends, now that we looked at several aspects of traditional and agile separately, let's quickly look at some of the differences at one place so we can understand the perspective a little better and in a broader context. So in the traditional model, the development and uh, delivery process is more of sequential where each phase needs to be completed in order to go to the next phase. Whereas in uh, agile, it's time boxed. Basically, it's uh, iterative or incremental product development and delivery. In the traditional requirements and design decisions are made upfront. Whereas in Agile, product owners and development teams have the opportunity to negotiate and reprioritize requirements throughout the development process. In traditional, months of planning happens before development begins. In uh, Agile, like not so much of long-term planning is required. It's made more of uh, intermediate milestones. Uh, you deliver in deployable increments with useful features. It may have minimum viable product functionality. In traditional, it's uh, broken into stages that need to be completed before you can go to the next. Whereas in Agile, there is complete transparency in development process. Each iteration or sprint delivery is done when it's programmed, tested, and so on. So that's what we call the working software in regular intervals. In traditional, the customer sees the product for the first time when final product is delivered. And in Agile, customer is constantly interacting with product and providing feedback and uh, able to see the progress, how the product is coming up. In traditional making changes uh, that too late in the process can be very expensive and time consuming. In Agile, changes are embraced in the iterative process through constant communication and prioritization. In traditional, only one initial investment to be spread out over the project timeline. Whereas in uh, Agile, it's a, an incremental investment process where money is released with phases. So you're not locking in for the big bang approach uh, on certain projects. So if you observe, we made sure that we repeated enough of uh, some of these basic concepts multiple times over the last three episodes. And I did it for a purpose because the more and more you hear in, uh, in uh, different formats, it really helps you to understand the underlying concepts um, 
which helps you later as we move forward and this should give you a good grasp of some of the very basic things about agile so with that we conclude this go agile 3 and we will meet again soon in go agile 4 till then stay safe and do good see ya Hello friends, welcome back to our Go Agile part 4. By the way, somebody asked me about the music videos. Yes, that's correct. I sing and I also host a music series called My Ranjani. If you follow the content, you can view that. If not, just ignore it. So coming back to Go Agile, hope you all got a good foundation on what Agile is broadly and how it is different from the traditional waterfall approach. So over the last three or so decades, so many companies exploring these new ways of development, generally referring to as Agile. It resulted in a number of different methods or frameworks and each of those are unique in their own way but have some commonalities to be broadly called agile. With that, here are some of the new frameworks that got created and since all of them have some common agile approach, the term agile has become more of a generic umbrella term and under that a variety of frameworks got evolved. Even I don't know much about all these frameworks so you don't even need to worry. But we will review Scrum because that is the most popular and we will also look at Kanban because a couple of people asked me. Uh, though I am not an authority on Kanban but I will try to cover Kanban in one of the sessions. Whatever limited knowledge I have on Kanban, uh, I will share. Anyway, so let's very quickly review at least their, uh, some of the definitions of these different frameworks. Kanban is a Japanese term meaning a signboard. Kanban, it's actually two words. It's originally introduced in Toyota company as a visual display for just-in-time manufacturing as a scheduling system. Coming to IT projects, it's basically a pull system where you have all the tickets and you pull tickets one by one based on your capacity and fix issues. So as I said earlier, we will try to do a separate session on Kanban. So DSDM stands for Dynamic Systems Development Method. It is an iterative and incremental approach. These are some of the very commonly used terms throughout Agile, iterative, incremental, so get used to the terms. So coming to DSDM, there is constant customer collaboration built into this model. Back in the day, there used to be a model called rapid application development. Some of you might have heard it. It used to be quite popular at one time, but it had its own weaknesses and a bit inconsistent. So DSDM was developed to bring the discipline into rapid application development. That's how it was born. The FDD stands for feature driven development. Again, FDD is also an incremental approach. The emphasis is on building client valued functionality through repeatable delivery of tangible software. It was first developed at a Singapore bank. It evolved into five different processes, develop overall model, build feature list, plan by feature, design by feature, build by feature. So as you can notice, it's mostly revolving around your features, which is nothing but the functionality. We are not going to details because you don't need to learn so many frameworks in the first place. Secondly, even I don't know much about them except one or two. But it's good if you know that such frameworks exist so you can relate to it if someone talks about them. Next is XP. XP stands for extreme programming. Here the emphasis is on how you can improve the quality of the software and being responsive to changing customer needs. XP is also generally called as uh, pair programming which means Two people will sit together and will jointly be working. While one writes the code, the other uh, then and there reviews the code. So this involves extensive code reviews. That's how they bring in very high quality standards. In a way, coding standards are taken to extreme level. That's why it's called extreme programming. Then you have Scrum. So Scrum is another lightweight framework. It is again iterative and uh, incremental and uh, responding to changing requirements and regularly releasing software. Uh, so pretty much they try to package all the agile uh, uh, concepts into Scrum. We will review again uh, Scrum in, uh, in detail later. Then you have Crystal. Crystal is the least heard framework. There is no clear methodology, but the belief is many times the output depends on the size of a team. And depending on the size of the team, the process and workflow changes. So they give different names to different team sizes like uh, crystal clear, crystal yellow, crystal orange, crystal red and so on. So crystal clear, I think it's teams with less than 8 people. Crystal yellow is teams with between 10 and 20 people. Crystal orange is teams with between 20 and 50 people. Crystal red is teams with between 50 and 100 people. So broadly the crystal model includes uh, seven processes. There's frequent delivery, 
reflective improvement osmotic communication uh, osmotic communication means uh, it's basically having teams in the same physical space like it's co-located that's very important as it allows information to flow between team members as it uh, as if by osmosis so that is that is how it's uh, the, the, that's how the name osmotic communication then you have personal safety team members should feel safe to discuss ideas openly without fear of ridicule so there are uh, no right or wrong answers or bad assertions in a crystal team and then you have focus on work team members should know what to work on next and be able to do it and this requires clear communication and documentation when required then number six is access to subject matter experts and users team members should be able to get feedback from real users and experts as and when required then you have the last one technical tooling development teams so the belief is that basically the toolings are very important and toolings by toolings what they mean is things like uh, the automated testing or configuration management or continuous deployment that means errors and mistakes can be caught quickly without human intervention so that's so, so it's basically uh, effectively using automation okay friends now that we reviewed uh, agile broadly and we also looked at different agile frameworks under the agile umbrella wow you're all super catching up quite well so now you know a lot of frameworks anyway so let's imagine you are starting your first agile project so what should be your mindset like what is the preparedness if you don't want to fail the first project what is it no you should do the right things let's quickly look at that so there are two aspects to it one mostly organizational related things like what kind of projects you can choose and all that stuff and the second is individually as a person what kind of preparedness you should have what kind of mindset you should have so let's see first uh, from an organizational perspective i know this is not in your hands it's dictated more by what the organization tells or what the committees decide but if you have any influence you should make some of these points and influence the decision to choose the right kind of project to make sure you don't fail so let's see first one dependencies so when you choose a project as your first project to try out agile make sure that the project has least number of dependencies see you know once uh, a project has uh, lesser uh, dependencies on other factors it's fairly easy to execute that so you choose that to try out agile because you you don't want to show that your first project has failed right it's very important perceptions are important so you want to show a win then change management this is a very interesting topic and very important too because unless there is right attitude it just can't be successful because they will constantly pulling you down it's like crab culture you know what crab culture is so in those uh, freight trains earlier when they have to ship these crabs they just don't put a lid on the top you know why because if one crab tries to crawl up two crabs pull it down so people are like that it's so it's very important that you choose right team who are open minded who have the zeal to try out new things to be part of your first pilot project so change management is very important and then open communication a big difference from traditional methods is that agile encourages very open communication so this again is mindset and attitude but team spirit is very important there is nothing like one person does well or one does bad either you all collectively win or you all collectively lose and then of course the right team uh, by right team i mean to make sure you, you try to get the right combination of people with all necessary skills uh, you don't want to just pull like three people just because they worked with you in the past though you need some some other skill so it has to be cross functional just make sure you uh, you address the cross functional needs as to what is required exactly for the project to be a success so be open to accept other people from other groups or new people but your emphasis should be to have the right cross functional combination of skills to make sure the project is a success and then uh, this is another interesting thing like uh, what is the urgency like for example there are some projects where there is uh, there is a lot of urgency and and that helps you a lot because once you choose a project that is uh, that that has a lot of urgency then you get a lot of management support you get a lot of support from other departments uh, to make sure this project is successful so it's very important so so also see okay which projects have that kind of urgency that burning desire that okay this project needs to be executed quickly or or some sort of uh, urgency to to deliver the project okay so these are some of the organizational aspects uh, uh, as a leader you have to make some effort to influence to make sure that you pick the right project right team right environment for your first agile project to be a success now in terms of what your mindset should be as an individual Okay, there are certain characteristics that that are highly encouraged 
and essential for an agile project to win so one take responsibility so days are gone that there is a project manager and he or she will take care uh, why should i worry well that's all over now the entire team should feel the same amount of responsibility and accountability you also you, you should also be receptive to hearing suggestions and coexisting with others transparency this is a tough ask the weakness many humans have is not to be transparent you have to break that barrier initially it is tough but once you come out of it it makes your life a lot easier and you will be liked a lot by others so full transparency is required for you to see a successful project team needs to be very transparent and it starts right with you don't give up life is not easy and smooth it's like a roller coaster ride there are going to be ups and downs you are trying something new have a positive attitude things will work out give a serious try things may fail that's okay but don't give up find solutions we know in teams people always try to find faults or problems which is not a big deal but finding a solution yes it's a big deal so try try as much as possible to find solutions within your boundaries and never say i am not here to solve all problems of course we know that rather you say i will put all my effort to solve the problems again that attitude is very important okay friends with that we conclude this uh, go agile part 4 uh, thanks for watching and uh, we'll meet again soon in go agile 5 take care bye Hello friends hope you are doing well welcome back to part 5 of the go agile series so in the last part we reviewed agile umbrella and the different frameworks that are generally categorized under the agile umbrella just wanted to clarify it's just not limited to those frameworks we saw but it's just a representation of some of the agile frameworks so kanban was one such framework we looked at as part of the go agile 4 now in this session we will review kanban in a more detailed way reason i am doing this first is because after this we will look at scrum and then from there we can proceed further beyond scrum which will be logical you will be surprised that kanban has a rich history associated to it back in 16th or 17th century in japan after a lot of troubles and conflicts japan started seeing some stability and economic growth as it started growing the streets of japanese towns started getting crowded with shops and small businesses so a lot of competition started shops were trying to attract customers and that's where they started using these sign boards that sign board in japanese is nothing but called kanban kan means sign and ban means a board interesting right as it picked up then they started improvising these boards with what they offer what products they have their specialties and so on some even started designer kanbans like if someone has a music shop put a musical instrument shaped board if someone sells fish put a fish shaped sign board and so on So many type of these uh, sign boards started appearing in the market but all these had one thing in common they were able to communicate the offering or product or service very clearly and concisely Now fast forward in 1940s Toyota the car manufacturer is not like what it is today they were in losses struggling to compete with american cars and a bit lost in the market they had a young and dynamic engineer by name Taiichi Ono He started to bring a lot of changes. One thing he started socializing is that in normal production routine, there are so many things we do which are not required and he started calling it waste. He came up with seven ways which are overproduction, inventory, delay or waiting time, overprocessing, transportation, unnecessary motion and defects in the product. So let's review quickly each one of these. over production he says demands keep changing so what's the point in producing more than what they can handle at a given time and it also has chain effect so producing more than what is required is a waste inventory carrying surplus raw materials is a waste his idea is keep only just the right quantities at that given time his idea is produce what is just needed and only when it's needed so this ensured that stocks are carried at the minimum while making sure a smooth flow of work is established so sometime in 50s tai chi wanted to find out what is that they are doing different in the us and made a visit but in his visit he observed something interesting in a grocery store he was very impressed by how they are able to keep the shelves stocked up with just the right amount of each product when the items are about to finish in a bin they place some yellow colored or or some card to indicate that the stock is likely to get over and which is like heads up 
Accordingly, they order more inventory. And at the end of the bin, they keep some red card or something to indicate that it's completely over. So he, he used the same concepts back in uh, Toyota. And number three is delay. Waiting or time spent in a queue with no value being added is also a waste. So in production line, there are many instances where the supplies line up in queue to be used and that serves no purpose because you need them only when you use them. That idling time is a waste. Next is over processing. So undertaking non-value added activity. Processes are ineffective and time is wasted when one process waits to begin while another finishes. Instead, the flow of operations should be smooth and continuous and probably parallel. According to some estimates, as much as 99% of a product's time in manufacture is actually spent in waiting. The next is transportation. So he thinks transportation also is a waste. Moving a product between manufacturing process adds no value. It's expensive and can cause damage or product deterioration. These are things like, for example, you dump the uh, stuff at one place and then from there you move to another place and uh, finally you bring to some other place where it's actually used in the production line. Then unnecessary motion. Resources are wasted when workers have to bend, reach or walk distances to do their jobs. Imagine a worker needs a particular type of wrench for a certain task. Now, if he has to walk for few meters because it's in the shelf there, that is an unnecessary waste of energy. Rather, if he kept the tool to his, in, in his pocket or something, he can avoid that extra movement. Defects in the product is another waste. The more you spend in inspecting the product for defects, it takes more time and costs money. He used all these seven ways and came up with a new system based on Kanban. He did many things as part of it, like he introduced paper cards for signaling and tracking the demand in the factory. And it revolutionized the entire production system at Toyota that the company almost rose from operating losses to a profitable global competitor. That is the famous Toyota production system based on Kanban. And Taichi Ono became to be known as father of the Toyota production system. So far, we looked at the birth of Kanban and how it got adopted at Toyota production system. Next, we need to see how this Kanban found its way into IT. So over time, the Toyota production system gained a lot of popularity globally. And so project managers all across started trying it in different flavors. But the biggest breakthrough came in software industry. And how it happened and what's that story, we will see in the next session of Go Agile Part 6. Till then, do good, wash your hands and stay safe. See ya. Hello friends, welcome back to Go Agile 6. So last time we started Kanban, we looked at the birth of Kanban and how it got adopted at Toyota production system. So today we will look at how Kanban found its way into IT and how it became one of the popular agile frameworks. So over time, the Toyota production system gained a lot of popularity globally and so project managers all over the world started trying it in different flavors. But the biggest breakthrough came in software industry. So from 2001 onwards, there were active discussions around agile, agile manifesto and so on, which we reviewed in the previous uh, episodes, right? So around 2005, one gentleman by name David Anderson took Toichi Ono's production system and started applying it in the IT process and came up with Kanban for IT. Predominantly, he called it the pull process. He came up with six principles for Kanban in IT. Visual workflow, limit work in progress, managing the flow, make the process pulses explicit, implement feedback loops and improve collaboratively. If you observe carefully, few things are becoming prominent in the system. Those are batch size, flow, queue, work in progress. Now let's try to understand these principles with some examples. There are two burger shops here. One is a ready to go burger shop and the other is a custom burger shop. In the ready to go shop, what they're doing is based on historic analysis, they figured a particular type of burger is most popular. Hey, these are just some examples, okay, to help you understand the underlying concept. So don't get into debates that uh, there are McDonald's sells so many types of burgers or Burger King sells uh, uh, so many different types of burgers and so on. We are not building a case study on burgers here. We are just evaluating some examples to understand the Kanban concepts. Okay, coming back. In the ready to go shop, they studied that certain types of burgers are popular and also analyzed that they get lots of people at certain time let's say 12 to 1 p.m. So what they do is they will create a number of those burgers and keep them ready just in time by 12. So people walk in, pick a burger, pay and go. So it's very efficient and faster. So they know, so they know in the 12 noon batch, 
let me make 50 burgers in 1 pm batch let me make 30 burgers so the batch size is very crucial here that determines overall delays efficiencies and, and even costs coming to the right side custom burger now a customer walks in picks and chooses whatever toppings or sides that he or she prefers so as the customer orders someone is literally fixing the burger so it's one customer at a time there is no concept of some 20 customers picking up and walking away you see the difference right so moral of this is how a batch production and right size of batch boosts your productivity and reduces costs now let's look at the flow and capacity again don't get confused i'm just using the terms as per my convenience but capacity again can relate to your batch size imagine there is a bridge at any given time there cannot be more than 100 vehicles on the bridge that means that is the maximum capacity of the bridge but technically you can fit in 200 cars at the same time on the bridge but just because you can fit in 200 cars if you allow so many to continuously go then what happens it can be chaos traffic mess delays accidents and bridge can even collapse right so never maintain at full capacity you won't have a smooth flow agree same thing in IT when you overload a member it can have many side effects there's one gentleman Don Reinertsen who is the author of a book called the principles of product development flow and he quotes in the book operating a product development process near full utilization is an economic disaster so what do you do you try to control the flow how do you control one method is you introduce a system of issuing cards uh, to each car that enters the bridge on both sides let's call them the north toll gate and south toll gate let's say you maintain 100 cards at north so on north when cars enter you issue a card when they exit at south gate they are supposed to return the card at that gate so the south gate operator uses the same cards to issue to cars entering on the south side and those cards are collected back at north gate when they exit so by this what you are trying to do is you are maintaining a steady flow so it always stays within your limits of 100 cars that's what we refer to as limiting the workflow and you can also visualize the workflow with the number of cards that are in your bin just take it as an example okay so we are just using it to understand our concepts of Kanban excellent now let's study the queue system imagine there is a coffee shop and there are customers walking in to order coffee now when more and more people come in what happens the queue becomes longer if queue becomes longer what does it translate to it directly translates to delays in the whole process increases the wait time quality of coffee could be compromised there could be some spills here and there wrong orders can be processed and the person making it could be demotivated so many things can happen so what he's saying is in IT projects you try to reduce the wait times so a professor by name John Little developed a formula to measure the average wait time which is you take the average queue length and divide it by average processing time don't worry too much to understand the formula and how it applies uh, for now but generally you just keep in mind longer queues are not good it leads to longer wait times it's funny little law deals with long queues so it makes it easy to remember right so the next is making process policies explicit so what he means is there could be policies uh, established but unless you explicitly communicate sometimes it's not of much use just to look at an example here the traffic policies exist but either they are not communicated properly or not understood and that can lead to chaos and even accidents right that's what you see in the picture now if the same policies are explicitly communicated and made to understand then the flow gets smoother that's what we do with uh, traffic cops or traffic lights right so that is what the right side picture is okay the next is implementing feedback loops so feedback loops are a vital part of Kanban we use feedback loops to tell us if the things we do are effective or, or, uh, or is it making an impact these feedback loops can be done through a set of meetings with different cadences you focus mainly on how you are getting things done how can you do it better and how you are doing the right things so there are seven different uh, meetings that Kanban uses uh, for feedback loops as you can see it's uh, highlighted with those circles in red so we don't need to go into details right now because we are not covering Kanban in uh, full detail but this is just to give you an idea as to how many places or how many instances that you can get feedback okay nice typically in Kanban there's no estimation it is continuous or ongoing tasks no time box iterations there are daily meetings but focus mainly on the impediments so the focus is going to be just on delivery based on capacity rather than overloading the developers if you imagine the number of issues or tickets or tasks that you need to complete they'll be put into an indefinite pipeline which, which in agile world we normally call it uh, backlog 
So there is a single indefinite backlog and developers pull the tickets from the backlog and process them. The backlog of items can always be prioritized or reprioritized. So if you see the board in each area such as input analysis, development, etc., you are pulling only the limited number of tickets from the previous bucket and working on them. How many are you pulling? You are pulling only what you can handle based on your team capacity. If you see the number 6432 on the top, that shows your team capacity in each bucket. So accordingly, you will pull only those number of items from previous bucket. So it's a pull system. Clear, right? So basically you are pulling. It is very evident that Kanban is a good fit for maintenance or service type of projects because it all runs by issues or tickets. You drop the tickets in an indefinite backlog. You can prioritize and put them in some order. Then team pulls the number of tickets they can handle and every group pulls from the previous bucket and it goes on. So that is Kanban in IT. So before concluding, let's look at some of the benefits from using Kanban. Number one, simplicity. By far, this is the least invasive agile framework to my knowledge. Fairly simple, flexible, and easy to execute. You don't need a lot of transition or knowledge compared to some of the other frameworks. In fact, I used this uh, in one of the instances uh, some time back and results were amazing for what we were doing at the time. Shorter lead time. Cycle time is a key metric for Kanban teams. Cycle time is the amount of time it takes for a unit of work to travel through the team's workflow from the moment work starts to the moment it ships. By optimizing cycle time, the team can confidently forecast the delivery of future work. And also overlapping skill sets also helps to uh, shorten the lead times. You, you're getting a cross-functional skill set. For instance, testing isn't done only by QA engineers. Developers pitch in too. In a Kanban framework, it's the entire team's responsibility to ensure work is moving smoothly through the process. And then focus on priority items. A Kanban team is only focused on the work that's actively in progress. Once the team completes a work item, they plug the next work item off the top of the backlog. Visibility. The Kanban board is pretty straightforward. You know exactly which task is where and it provides a lot of visibility. Continuous delivery is the practice of releasing work to customers frequently. Kanban and CD beautifully complement each other because uh, both techniques focus on the just-in-time delivery of value. The faster a team can deliver innovation to market, the more competitive their product will be in the marketplace. And Kanban teams focus just precisely on that, optimizing the flow of delivery to customers. Then reduction of waste. You are focusing just on the essential items rather than working on some unwanted tasks. To the point, so wastage is minimized. The Kanban method seeks to achieve balance between customer demands and business capabilities. This balance between these two is what determines how stable your IT organization is. Many times when you lose this balance, that is when you see overworked workforce, uh, productivity going low or uh, quality going low, uh, delivery is getting delayed and so on. So Kanban model helps to get that balance. So with that, we conclude uh, Kanban. Uh, I hope you liked it. I thought this will give a good overview of uh, the whole Kanban system. If you are interested further, you can always uh, get some advanced training in Kanban. And with that, we also conclude this Go Agile 6. We'll meet again soon in Go Agile 7. Till then, stay safe and see you.